And so it was. Casanova was born into humble beginnings in Venice. Educated at Padua University, he found an interest in the books on the macabre and erotic. His early encounters with high society were the benefit and good fortune of embracing a life in the church by becoming a priest. Although fate had something else in store for Casanova, losing his virginity to two sisters, his future in the church was extinguished. But through his benefactor, Senator Bragadin, he was reborn into high society, and a new life of gambling and seduction began. Think only of enjoying yourself. Take me as your advisor in everything that may happen to you, and you may be certain of always finding me your friend. I'm not sure if Casanova was uh, himself somebody everyone would like. Could you accept a man like me? Oh, well then, I must believe that you are not a perfect man. If you show, would show any sign of disrespect, any sign of not taking him serious, I think you would be out. On the other hand, if he had people whom he liked, his friends were real good friends. My spirit is strong enough to resist even so fatal a blow, for I know I have a friend in you. At least tell me, madam, whether the captain is your husband or your father. I flatter myself I can convince her to sacrifice that lover for me. It is my most ardent wish. And to realize it, I'm ready to do anything. Absolutely. Divine. <laughs> I knew you'd give in. At the opera, Casanova met a dancer named Marina. He'd met her once before in Corfu. He went to a house for dinner where he met her lover, who called himself Count Selly. But he wasn't actually a count, he was a gambler, and he was in a bad mood. He called Marina a prostitute, to which she replied, yes, and for you are my procurer. With that, he threw a knife at her face, but missed. He chased after Marina. Casanova took out his dagger and said, stop, or you're a dead man. He and Marina left. Casanova and Selly agreed to meet the next day to settle this dispute. Marina told Casanova that he was in fact a pimp and rented her out to his friends for money. The next day, Casanova arrived at the appointed venue to meet with the Count. The Count had not yet arrived. I entered the coffee room to wait for him. I met a good-looking Frenchman there and I addressed him. Being pleased with his conversation, I told him that I expected the arrival of a man and that as my honour required that he should find me alone, I would be very grateful if he would go away as soon as I saw the man approaching. The Count came in with his follower, who was sporting a sword at least 40 inches long and had all the look of a cutthroat. 
I do not cross swords with a dancer, said the cutthroat. He had scarcely uttered these words when my friend, going up to him, told him that a dancer was certainly as good as a black leg, and gave him a violent blow with the flat of his sword on the face. I followed his example with Sally, who began to beat a retreat, and said that he only wanted to tell me something, and that he would fight afterwards. Well, speak. You know me, and I do not know you. Tell me who you are. My only answer was to resume laying my sword upon this scoundrel while the Frenchman was showing the same dexterity upon the back of his companion. But the two cowards took to their heels, and there was nothing for us to do but to sheathe our weapons. Thus did the duel end in a manner even more amusing than Marina herself had anticipated. The Frenchman, whom he had discovered was Antonio Belletti, ended up with Marina. I hate old age. It offers only what I already know. Age has calmed my passions by rendering them powerless. But my heart has not grown old. My memory has kept all the freshness of youth. No. I have not forgotten Henri. Casanova's greatest love in his memoirs is Henriette. And it starts in a weird way. Casanova is in a hotel in Cesena, and he hears a lot of noise in the next room. What happens? He is curious, so he wants to go and know more about it. He goes and looks and sees there is the police of the Inquisition bouncing on the door of the next room because they uh, have got air that there is somebody in the room, a man sleeping with a girl who is not the wife, which was forbidden by the Pope. Well, Casanova interferes. He finds that there is an old um, Hungarian officer with a young Hungarian officer, at least, dressed like one, but apparently later on it will prove to be Henriette. Um, Henriette, to make the story a bit shorter, is running away from home. She says, my husband and my father-in-law are monsters. So she eloped from somewhere with this Hungarian um, officer. They have trouble in communicating because the Hungarian speaks Hungarian and Latin. No French. And Henriette speaks French and no Hungarian and no Latin. Taking the opportunity to spend some time with her, he offered the services of his carriage to her and her companion. But my business uh, was in reference to a carriage for the one I had boasted of existed only in my imagination. So what did you do? I went to the most fashionable coffee house, and as good luck would have it, heard that there was a traveling carriage for sale, which no one would buy because it was too expensive. I, like a fool, bought it. <laughs> Using somebody else's money, of course. At least tell me, madam, whether the captain is your husband or your father. Neither one nor the other. Henriette could not open her lips without my discovering some fresh perfection. For her wit delighted me even more than her beauty, and it seemed evident to me that she would not be sorry to exchange her elderly lover for me. Something being the matter with the carriage, we stopped at Forli to have it repaired. After a very cheerful supper, I retired to my room to go to bed, thinking of nothing else but that very charming woman by whom I was so completely captivated. <laughs> On the journey, Henrietta struck me as so, so strange, 
I would not sleep in the second bed in their room, lest she should leave her old comrade and come to my bed to sleep with me. And I did not know how the worthy captain would take such a joke. Well, didn't you want her? Of course. I wanted to possess that lovely creature. But I wanted everything to be, to be settled amicably. For I, I had certain respect for the old brave officer. As for the captain, I felt certain that from what he had told me that he would not be angry with me if I risked a declaration, for as a sensible man, he could only assume a neutral position. When I was ready, I repaired to the chamber occupied by my two traveling companions. Morning. Morning. And after paying each of them the usual morning compliments, I told the officer that I was deeply in love with Henriette, and I asked him whether he would object to my trying to obtain her as my mistress. The reason for which she begs you to leave her in Palma and not to take any further notice of her must be that she hopes to meet some lover of hers there. Let me have half an hour's conversation with her and I flatter myself I can convince her to sacrifice that lover for me. If she refuses me, I will remain here. You will go with her to Palma while you leave my carriage, only sending me the receipt so that I might collect it whenever I please. As soon as breakfast is over, I shall go and visit the Institute and leave you alone with Henriette. I hope you may succeed, for I should be happy to see her under your protection when I part with her. Should she persist in her first resolve, then I could easily find a vetturino here and you could keep your carriage. I thank you for your proposal and it will grieve me to leave you. Thank you. Highly pleased at having accomplished half of my task and at seeing myself near the denouement, I asked the lovely Frenchwoman whether she would like to see the sights of Bologna. I should like it very much. The captain was uh, continuing his journey in on the one way and Casanova went with her to Parma. Uh, he found out that she was a very pretty girl, and uh, in the first uh, uh, shop of good fashion, he bought a wonderful robe for her, dressed her up as a girl, and, well, it was a miracle to see how she changed from a handsome officer to a wonderful young lady. Sooth to say, I fell at her feet, and lovingly pressing her knees, kissed them repeatedly with raptures of joy and gratitude. No more furore, no more bitter words. They do not suit the sweetest of all human emotions. Loving, docile, tender. I swear never to beg for anything, not even to kiss her hand, until I have shown myself worthy of her precious love. The heavenly creature delighted to see me pass so rapidly from despair to lively tenderness, whispers in a voice that breathes of love to come up from my knees. And? And. Her emotion and charm, which seemed to flow from her lips to enforce conviction, made me shed tears of love and sympathy. I blended her tears with those falling from her beautiful eyes. I promised not to abandon her and to make her the sharer of my fate. I felt really disposed to make her happy. I could not believe that I inspired in her a very deep passion. Am I not then always the same? No, heavenly creature. And it is so true that you are no longer the same in my eyes that I could now use any familiarity towards you.
Those that believe that a woman is incapable of keeping a man happy equally all the 24 hours have never known a woman such as Henriette. The joy that flooded my soul was far greater when I conversed with her during the day than when she lay in my arms at night. A beautiful woman without a mind of her own leaves a man with no resource after he has physically enjoyed her charms. An ugly woman of great intelligence will make him fall so deeply in love that she leaves him feeling no unsatisfied desires. So what must I have been? For Henriette was intelligent, beautiful, and cultured. You are lucky indeed to have loved in that way. It's impossible to describe the extent of my happiness. They travel together for a while and Casanova manages to uh, take the place of the Hungarian officer. Intrigued by Henriette, Casanova falls very, very deeply in love with her. Um, he says the nights with her were wonderful, but the days her conversation, uh, what she did, her culture, that was really the end. And he is much impressed about her playing the cello. And she didn't play the cello the prude way with the legs together and the cello left from her, but with the cello between her legs. And she was reprimanded for it at the convent because this was an obscene way to play for a girl. Mr. André uh, in X found also a picture of Ariette, a huge family picture with two girls, Ariette and the little sister, on it. And uh, in the corner, the cello with an angel with one finger pointing at Ariette. And the interpretation is that she is playing this machine and on the other finger, on the lips saying, she's not playing like this, but she's playing like that. <laughs> we don't know, of course. It's an interpretation, but a nice one. Age has calmed my passions by rendering them powerless. But my heart has not grown old. My memory has kept all the freshness of youth. No. I have not forgotten Henri yet. For even now, when my head is covered with white hair, the recollection of her is still a source of happiness in my heart. What embitters my old age is that, having a heart as warm as ever, I have no longer the strength necessary to secure a single day as blissful as those which I owe to this charming girl. Henriette uh, had already asked Casanova to keep a low profile because well, she was, it looked as if she was fearing someone, something would happen there, someone would recognize her. And of course, this happened. Uh, there was a talk between her and a gentleman in the court of Parma, and that made Henriette sad, and she said to Casanova, I believe this is going to be the end of our voyage because I have been recognized. Uh, this gentleman you saw yesterday has uh, told me that I should come home from where I came and that I should pick up my uh, old life again. She had never told uh, Casanova that there was an old life. They had a very sad night shedding tears for uh, having to end this love. It is I, dearest and best friend, who have been compelled to abandon you. But do not let your grief be increased by any thought of my sorrow. Let us be wise enough to suppose that we have had a happy dream and not to complain of destiny. For never did so beautiful a dream last for so long. Let us be proud of the consciousness that for three months we gave one another the most perfect felicity. Few human beings can boast of so much. Let us swear never to forget one another. 
and to often remember the happy hours of our love in order to renew them in our souls, which, although divided, will enjoy them as acutely as if our hearts were beating one against the other. Do not make any inquiries about me. And if chance should let you know who I am, forget it forever. I feel certain that you will be happy to hear that I have arranged my affairs so well that for the remainder of my life, I shall be as happy as I can possibly be without you, dear friend, by my side. I do not know who you are, but I feel certain that nobody in this world knows you as well as I do. I will always remember her. I recall now, even 40 years later, the last morning I spent with her. I had admired her lovely face, sleeping. All I knew of her came back to mind. The words that had been spoken by her bewitching mouth. Her rare talent, her candor, her feelings so full of delicacy, her misfortunes, everything had strengthened my resolution to make her the companion of my destiny, whatever it might be. I was determined to give our union the sanction of religion and law and to take her legally to be my wife. But alas, life has many cruelties, and that is the death of love. I shall not have another lover as long as I live. But I do not wish you to imitate me. Au contraire, I hope that you will love again. And I trust that a good fairy will bring along your path another on the earth. Farewell. Farewell. <laughs> Arietta, with her diamond ring, uh, wrote in the window pane, you'll forget Arietta also one day. But Casanova didn't. And the next morning, she took a coach and said to Casanova, you have to stay in the hotel. Don't follow me. You shouldn't know where, where I come from or where I go to. Uh, I'm very sorry that this story has to end now. Uh, tonight, stay in your room, and tonight I'll send my coachman back with a letter to you. And that was the last what Casanova saw of Ariete in Geneva. In Turin, he met an actress at the theater to drown his sorrows. But he acquired a dose of gonorrhea and was confined to bed for several weeks. The doctors came and administered mercury. Casanova's attitude to venereal disease was that the disease might leave scars, but we are easily consoled when we consider that we gain them with pleasure, as soldiers take pride in seeing their scars. Casanova went through such pain and depression that on the advice of a priest, he returned to pray in church to avoid women and gambling. Senator Bragadin welcomed Casanova back into the palace with open arms, but it wasn't long before he was tempted back to the gambling tables and the charms of beautiful women. He also won a large sum of money on the lottery. His friend Belletti turned up in Venice with Marina. They were on the way to the Italian theater in Paris, and they asked if Casanova would like to join them. He gladly accepted the invitation, and on their way, they stopped off at Lyon. It was in Lyon that Casanova made his most important step into the higher echelons of power and European aristocracy. 
It was here that he joined the world of Freemasonry. In a chamber, he was invoked into the secret society. He took on the Mason's apron and under oath swore loyally to the secret society by pain of death. He drew blood from a ritual dagger. The world of Freemasonry gave him access to some of the most powerful men and women in Europe. It was his final break from the Catholic Church who disapproved of members joining. In Paris, Casanova stayed with his friend Balletti. He moved in high society and visited some of the best brothels in Paris. There he met the writer, Claude Pierre Patou, who took him to the most famous bordello in Paris called Hotel de Roule, that was run by Madame Paris. She looked after the girls, she fed them, gave them wine and a clean bed. When visitors arrived, they were checked by a servant and taken into a room where all the girls sat, dressed in white, sewing. They were small, large, blonde and brunette. Once a girl was chosen, they were taken upstairs for dinner. There, Casanova met a girl named San Hilaire. He was so besotted by her. He visited her over 10 times, spending at least 500 pounds on her charms. The writer Patou also introduced him to an Irish girl named Victoria O'Murphy, who had a sister named Louise O'Murphy, who soon would become subject to one of the most erotic paintings and would become mistress to King Louis XV. Casanova offered her thousands of pounds for her virginity, but she refused. Casanova, however, was still up to his amorous ways. He got his landlady's daughter Mimi pregnant. When Madame Quinson found out that Casanova was the father, she beat her daughter and immediately reported Casanova to the police, who was pulled up in front of the court. In his defence, Madame Quinson had sent Mimi to his room. The court agreed and Casanova was let off, and Madame Quinson was made to pay all the court fees. Mimi's child was born and Casanova took care of them both. Tired of Paris, Casanova moved on to Vienna. However, Casanova did not stay in Vienna for long. The Empress Marie Theresa has set up a commission of chastity in the interests of purity and health. Prostitutes and escorts seen walking the street were watched by 500 plain clothed detectives. Many working girls would declare that they're on the way to church to pray and would use a rosary to prove their innocence. Casanova could not find any available women and decided to head back to Venice and to the world of the aging Senator Bragadin. On his journey, an incident occurred with a passing carriage. Having therefore left Padua at the very instant of the fatality, I met at Origago a cabriolet drawn at full speed by two post horses containing a very pretty woman and a man wearing a German uniform. Within a few yards from me, the vehicle was suddenly upset on the side of the river, and the woman falling over the officer was in great danger of rolling into the Brenta. I jumped out of my chaise without ever stopping my postillion and rushing to the assistance of the lady, I remedied with a chaste hand the disorder caused to a toilet by a fall. Her companion, who had picked himself up and without any injury, hastened towards us, and there was a lovely creature sitting on the ground, thoroughly amazed and less confused by her fall than from the indiscretion of her petticoats, which had exposed in all their nakedness certain parts which an honest woman never shows to a stranger. <laughs> in the warmth of her thanks, which lasted till, till her postillion and mine had righted her carriage, she often called me her savior, her guardian angel. Casanova sparked up a brief relationship with the girl. It transpired that she was the mistress of her companion, the officer, who was in some financial trouble. He came to Casanova several times for financial aid, but Casanova refused the loan. Finally, Casanova agreed to meet the officer's family, promising himself this would be the last time he was bothered by this nuisance officer, but he was left dazzled by the officer's sister, Katerina. A few days later, the officer came back to Casanova, inviting him to the opera with him and his sister. The scoundrel didn't mention his letters of exchange again, and as he saw, I was no longer interested in his mistress, but was in love with his sister, formed the excellent project of selling her to me. Certainly was a scoundrel. Indeed. I pity the mother and daughter who put any confidence in that man. 
But I did not have the strength to resist the temptation. And I even went so far as to persuade myself that as I was in love with her, it was my duty to accept the offer, to protect her from further snares. For if I had not accepted the offer, her brother might have offered her to some other man. And I could not stand that idea. A noble intention. I felt that in my company, her innocence ran no risk. Afterwards, her brother told his sister that I was in love with her and that it would certainly please me if she allowed me to kiss her. Her only answer was to offer me her laughing lips, which seemed to, seemed to call for kisses. I was burning, but my respect for her innocence was such that I just kissed her on the cheek and that in a manner very cold in appearance. Come, come, said the officer. Give her a good lover's kiss. I didn't move. The impudent fellow annoyed me. And then the sister turned her head sadly and said, Do not press him. I'm not so alluring as to please him. That remark gave the alarm to my love. I could no longer master my feelings. What? Beautiful Katerina. You do not presume to ascribe my reserve to the feeling you have inspired me with. You suppose you do not please me? If a kiss is all that is needed to prove the contrary to you, receive it now, with all the sentiment that is burning in my heart. Then, folding her in my arms and pressing her lovingly against my breast, I imprinted on her mouth the long and ardent kiss which I had so much wished to give her. But the nature of that kiss made the timid dove feel that she had fallen into the vulture's claws. She escaped from my arms, amazed at having discovered my love in such a manner. Now can you still doubt that I love you? You have convinced me. Because you have undeceived me, you must not punish me. The next day, the officer informed Casanova that Caterina had told her mother that they were in love. But he reassured Casanova that the mother was pleased with the relationship. However, the father, who did not know yet, was unlikely to be pleased with the news. Casanova kissed the mother's hand and told her that he would get a friend to speak to the father when he was in a comfortable position to look after Caterina. He managed to persuade Bragadin to speak to the father on his behalf. He spent the evening with Katerina and told her about Bragadin and his intention to ask for her hand in marriage. My father thinks of me now as if I were nothing but a child. And his eyes are going to be opened respecting me. He will examine my conduct and God knows what will happen. Now, we are happy. Even more than we were during our visits to Zueka we can see each other every night without restraint. But what will my father do when he hears that I have a lover? What can he do? If he refuses me your hand, I will carry you off. And the patriarch would surely marry us. We shall be one another's for life. It is my most ardent wish. And to realize it, I am ready to do anything. But dearest, I know my father. The next day after dinner, her father called upon Monsieur de Bragadine, but I did not show myself. He remained a couple of hours with my three friends, and as soon as he had gone, I heard that his answer had been what the mother had told me, but with the addition of a circumstance most painful to me, namely that his daughter would pass the four years which were to elapse before she could think of marriage in a convent. The story of CC and MM is just as interesting to, uh, well, to anybody, but especially to Casanovis, as the story of Henriette. CC and MM were girls from Venice. Casanova uh, first met CC, but we know who it was. It was Katina. And uh, they made love, and Katina became pregnant. She uh, wanted to conceal this, uh, went into a convent and in, on the island of Murano, and from there on con corresponded with Casanova. 
and uh, he went as uh, often, often as he could to Murano to attend mass in the convent. So from behind the iron bars, uh, Katrina could see him and sometimes he could have a quick look and uh, see Katrina. My servant brought to my room a woman who had a letter for me. I recognized at once a seal which I had given to Katerina. I thought I would drop down dead. Before I can write all I have to say, I must be sure of my messenger. I am boarding in a convent, and I am very well treated, and I enjoy excellent health in spite of the anxiety of my mind. The superior has been instructed to forbid me all visitors and correspondence. I am, however, already certain of being able to write to you, notwithstanding these very strict orders. I entertain no doubt of your good faith, my beloved husband, and I feel sure that you will never doubt a heart which is wholly yours. Trust to me for the execution of whatever you may wish me to do, for I am yours and only yours. Answer only a few words until we are quite certain of our messenger. In this convent also lived a girl indicated by Casanova as M.M. And she became friends with uh, Katina. And uh, Katina appointed through the uh, iron bars, that's him, that's my friend. And M.M. apparently thought, ah, looks good. I must tell something about the background of M.M. Otherwise, it's un understandable. M.M. was a girlfriend with the French ambassador in Venice. While in the convent, something unheard of, of course, but she was. And apparently, for some reason, she had found a possibility of sneakily leaving the convent and go and see her French ambassador. The ambassador Berni, later he, he would be a cardinal, which makes it even more piquant, the story. Um, this uh, French uh, envoyé had to go to Vienna and had to leave his mistress in in uh, Venice, and he hated to, to leave her, well, the, just like that. So he was a very practical man and had invited her to look around and see, wouldn't you find someone else who could take care of you, uh, whom you would like to be with every now and then. And uh, well, M.M. had heard from C.C. that there, looking through the bars, you could see on Sunday Casanova, and she thought, that's a nice guy. So she, she suggested to the ambassador, maybe this young girl, uh, boy, Casanova. A nun who for the last two months and a half has seen you every Sunday in the convent of her church, wishes to become acquainted with you. I feel certain that you will answer me and that you will feel how impatiently I am waiting for your letter. I entreat you, therefore, to give it to the same person with whom you will receive mine. You will find her one hour before the noon in the church of St. Cancian, near the first altar on the right. Casanova returned to the convent a few days later to ask to see M.M. A nun told him that she was otherwise engaged for the rest of the day. Casanova was insulted, and having written Emma a letter, he decided to put her out of his mind. It was purely by chance that ten days later, he bumped into the courier that had been delivering his letters, and he told him that M.M. had replied. He gizzily went back to the convent to see M.M. Our acquaintance has begun with a violent storm. Let us hope that we shall now enjoy it long, in perfect and lasting calm. This is the first time that we speak to one another. But what has occurred must be enough to give us a thorough knowledge of each other. I trust that our intimacy will be as tender as sincere, 
and that we shall know how to have a mutual indulgence for our faults. Can such an angel as you have any? Who is without them? When shall I have the happiness of convincing you of my devotion with complete freedom and in all the joy in my heart? We will take supper at my casino whenever you please, provided you give me notice two days beforehand. Oh, I could go and sup with you in Venice, if it will not disturb your arrangements. It would only increase my happiness. I'm in very easy circumstances and far from fearing expense, I delight in it. All I possess belongs to the woman I love. Such confidence, my dear friend, is very agreeable to me. The more so did I have likewise to tell you that I am very rich and that I could not refuse anything to my lover. You have a lover? Yes, it is through him that I am rich and he is entirely my master. I never conceal anything from him. The day after tomorrow, when I am alone with you, I will tell you more. But I hope that your lover will not... Will not be there? Certainly not. Have you a mistress? I had one, but alas, she has been taken from me by violent means. And for the last six months, I have led a life of complete celibacy. Do you love her still? I cannot think of her without loving her. She has almost as great charms and as great beauty as you. But I foresee that you will make me forget her. If your happiness with her was complete, I pity you. For she has been violently taken away from you. And you shun society in order to feed your sorrows. I have guessed right, have I not? But if I happen to take possession of her place in your heart, no one, my sweet friend, no one will turn me out of it. But what will your lover say? He will be delighted to see me happy with such a lover as you. It is in his nature. <laughs> what an admirable nature. Such heroism is quite beyond me. What sort of life do you lead in Venice? I live in the theatres, in society, in the casinos, where I fight against fortune, sometimes with good, sometimes with bad success. Do you visit foreign ambassadors? No, for I'm too much acquainted with the nobility. But I know them all. How do you know them if you do not see them? I've known them abroad. In Parma, the Duke de Montalegre, the Spanish ambassador. In Vienna, I knew Count Rosenberg. In Paris, Monsieur Berny, about two years ago, the French ambassador to Venice. It is nearly 12 o'clock, my sweet friend. Time for us to part. Come at the same hour the day after tomorrow and I will give you all the instructions which you will require to enable you to come and sup with me. Alone? Of course. Uh, there was a meeting in a house outside the convent where Casanova met this M.M. And where they, uh, well, not the first time, but uh, very soon made love and had wonderful dinners and, uh, well, it was beautiful. The relationship between Casanova and M.M. blossomed. He still wrote to Katerina, but his passion was now focused on M.M. As the romance developed, M.M. wrote to Casanova, making an unexpected proposition. Now, dearest, I have only this to say. Do you feel disposed to allow yourself to be seen by another man? while you are abandoning yourself to the sweet voluptuousness of your senses. The doubt causes all my anxiety, and I entreat from you an answer, yes or no. Do you understand how painful the doubt is for me? I expect not to close my eyes throughout the night, and I shall not rest until I have your decision. In case you should object to show your tenderness in the presence of a third person, I will take whatever determination love may suggest to me. But I hope that you will consent. And even if you are not to perform a character of an ardent lover in a masterly manner, it would not be of any consequence. I will let my friend believe that your love has not yet reached its apogee. My friend is not yet at his post, 
but the moment he is there, I will give you a wink. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the uh, Fr French uh, envoy hadn't departed yet. He wanted to meet Casanova too, but wanted to meet Casanova um, in, uh, together with M.M. And what he did was that in the house, outside of the convent, he had in a room made a little hole in which he could spy and look at the, nether, the next room. Where is the mysterious closet? There it is, behind that wall. There is a bed, a table, and everything necessary to a person who wants to spend the night amusing himself by looking at what is going on in this room. I will show it to you whenever you like. One day, uh, the Frenchman was sitting behind the hall, and M.M. said to Casanova, my friend is behind there. Uh, don't look at it now because he is there already. So I will let just pretend that he, uh, we don't know that he is there. But if you play your part naturally, he will not feel any wariness. I will be most natural, but more polite. Oh, no. No politeness, I beg. For if you are polite, goodbye to nature. Wherever you have seen, I would like to know, two lovers excited by all the fury of love think of politeness. The clock striking 12, I showed her the principal actor who was longing to perform. And then they made love in a very nice way. Casanova thought, well, he's looking there like a film director. I have to move like this so that he doesn't miss anything of the fun. And uh, well, when that was uh, done, uh, he heard through the hole, well done, my boy. <laughs> Wonderful. It wasn't long before Katerina discovered the affair between M.M. and Casanova. She noticed a ring on M.M.'s finger, similar to the one that Casanova had bought her. Surprisingly, Katerina was very happy about this. And one evening, Casanova was letting himself into M.M.'s room, for which he had his own key. And there stood Katerina, dressed as a nun. They spent all night talking, and Casanova was confused as to whether this was a setup. In his anger, Casanova left his key. Having narrowly avoided getting married, Casanova's heart was stolen by the mysterious Henriette, a woman for whom he would love like no other ever again. As soon as breakfast is over, I shall go and visit the Institute and leave you alone with Henriette. Henriette. But we have to say goodbye to each other. And I trust that a good fairy will bring along your path another on yet. He thinks he's going to die. I was determined to give our union the sanction of religion and law and to take her legally to be my wife. But alas, life has many cruelties, and that is the death of love. It is my most ardent wish. And to realize it, I'm ready to do anything. Such confidence, my dear friend, is very agreeable to me. Your old girlfriend with a new girlfriend. Well, OK, two girlfriends, that's fine. I'm pregnant, and I shall kill myself if I'm found out. This rich man uh, wouldn't uh, marry a pregnant girl. The hundred guineas are at your disposal. The degraded dupe of a vile prostitute. Absolutely divine. Tomorrow morning, I shall ask you to come with me before the magistrate. 